Dr. Schultz, today we're talking about clinical trials. Now, the term clinical trials can sometimes be quite intimidating to patients, and I think that there is some thoughts, you know, can we use clinical trials early? Is it really only for late stage patients when we're out of options? So we want to bring some clarity to that situation. So first of all, can you describe what a clinical trial is and the different phases of it and how it applies to patients? I like to think of clinical trials more in terms of how do they serve patients. Everyone, society in general, is uh, very grateful that people participate in clinical trials and, and lead to a deeper understanding of what treatments work and which treatments don't work. The patients who many times are participating in these trials are in somewhat desperate straits. They've tried a lot of FDA-approved medications and may have had some success or limited success. And the FDA-approved medications that uh, remain or limited or non-existent and the natural question is what kind of new research is ongoing that may help out these individuals live better, live longer. There's some competing interests in the world of clinical trials because the patients want to get results. Um, researchers want to find out what works and in the process of finding out what works, sometimes medicines that aren't that effective are studied. Uh, clinical trials break down into uh, three echelons of study, uh, phase one, two, and three. One means that it's a brand new medicine and we're trying to find out what is the right dosage. So they slowly escalate dose until side effects occur and then that becomes the dose. Phase two is after they've figured out what the right dose is, then they give a certain medicine to a certain group of patients that have a certain stage of disease, certain type of cancer and, and uh, observe for response. Does the cancer recede? And can we confirm that the drug is tolerable? Phase three is after a phase two trial shows that there's activity, uh, that some people are indeed benefiting. The, that new uh, treatment or medication is then compared against another standard known medicine to either confirm that it's at least as good or better than that. And those are called phase three trials. Before I get to my next question, if you would like to join our cause and donate to PCRI, you can do so at PCRI.org. Now back to my next question on clinical trials. So when I think of a clinical trial, oftentimes I think of it as, you know, quite an arduous process. You know, they're traveling, they're going to the doctor, finding the right one. You know, what, when would a patient get a clinical trial and what timing and what sequence would those types of, you know, things be necessary? The mechanism that surrounds clinical trials is more complex than someone going to a doctor's office and getting a, a chemotherapy drug or or uh, some sort of therapy because the data collection is more arduous and the selection of patients. So it's more time consuming and possibly involves more scans, more blood tests. And that's, I think, not the only reason that makes clinical trials somewhat unattractive to patients is that there, it's also the uncertainty as to whether this medicine will work because we're still learning how effective it is. Anytime people are picking a treatment for treatment of cancer, you want to know how effective is it and how toxic is it? Is this really the type of uh, treatment that I should be embarking upon? Clinical trials, as a result, are often reserved for a situation where other standard treatments are, have already been tried and are, are no longer working. So that is a natural place for these clinical trials to occur. You asked earlier about uh, people going on clinical trials for earlier stage prostate cancer, and if Existing treatment is as good as it is, and it is really good. Venturing into unknown treatments doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's why clinical trials tend to be reserved for people who have advanced disease that isn't responding to other standard treatments. So in those situations, are patients getting access to the drug no matter what if they're on the clinical trial? I think that, you know, we have placebo arms, but can you explain that to the patient? Because I know a couple of patients who went on clinical trials and they didn't even know that was a possibility. Right, so that's the phase three, the comparative stage. Uh, I'd say the most desirable clinical trials for people that are looking for results is uh, to participate in a phase two clinical trial uh, because 100% of the patients get the active medication. There is no placebo in a phase two trial. Phase three trials, treatment is often compared to a standard treatment uh, versus a, uh, a new treatment. And so some sort of treatment will be administered, but if the standard treatment was that great, there wouldn't be a comparison or, or a hope for getting something better. So yes, that is the, the limitation of phase three is that you may 
not even get the trial that you're hoping to get. When it comes to phase two trials, is there a concern since they're testing the appropriate dosage that a patient would get too much or too little and there would either be no effect or they would you know, suffer some significant side effects? There is that concern. It's bigger with the phase one trials while they're still learning the dose. But in the whole field of oncology, this balance between toxicity and effectiveness is a constant issue. Uh, giving chemotherapy, for example, the doses sometimes need to be adjusted down when people have too many side effects because not every individual responds exactly the same to medications. So what the Prostate Cancer Research Institute has been doing for many years is educating patients about these sorts of decisions. And I think the, the learning and the study process is even more intensified when you start going into the field of clinical trials. A couple reasons. One is that there is a big business of doing clinical trials, so researchers that are working at large academic centers are looking for patients to participate in the trials, and sometimes the interests of the patient are somewhat secondary to let's get people in, let's get our trial finished. So patients need to be aware of that. There's another misconception that I see sometimes patients have, and that is that if it's new, it must be good. And uh, that is not always accurate. It can be true, but patients need to research. When we named the Prostate Cancer Research Institute, the Research Institute, what we were really talking about is patients researching their options before they make these big decisions. And the, there's a need to get educated about these medicines which, uh, for which there is less information. Where are you going to get that information? The, Researchers who are doing the trial will have some familiarity with these new medicines as they've observed the effects of these medicines in the patients that they've already treated. If you're the first person going on the trial, of course, that's not available. But if there have been other patients who've gone before you, the researchers will generally disclose what kind of early results they're seeing. Are they encouraging or not? That's an important thing to look at because there are going to be different options available at different centers, and patients not only need to decide if they want to go on a trial, but which trial will be the one that gives them the best chance for having a good response. So how do patients go about finding these trials? I think that there's a lot of, there's the criteria of which one you can even, you know, be eligible for, but finding a trial, you know, where are they looking? People can go online to clinicaltrials.gov, but that can be challenging because there's a lot of, a lot of jargon and a lot of technical aspects. I think that the large academic centers uh, are a, a good resource and to consult with physicians that are doing full time research and um, build a relationship with them in terms of what kind of clinical trials are available. And the time to do this is the time when things are going well because it can be a somewhat time consuming process. If the last treatment that someone had is proven to be ineffective, the clock is ticking at that point and we, you want to be able to move smoothly into a new treatment and not waste time and give the cancer uh, the freedom to grow without being under any therapy. So you've been in practice for 30 years with prostate cancer patients. Now, have you had patients go on clinical trials and have miraculous responses? I've been you know, espousing some of the precautions that people need to have, but one of the good things, of course, is that early access to effective treatment is, is a great opportunity. When Zytiga was approved or studied back in around 2010, we, our office was one of the largest accruers for patients to participate in that trial. Uh, a new medicine shown to be very effective, relatively few side effects, and some of those patients uh, who were put on Zytiga back in that time are still responding and still alive because of the excellent response that they had to that early access for that wonderful medicine. It sounds like, Dr. Schulz, that the patients who would probably be seeking clinical trials are people who have had metastatic disease, hormone ther therapy is no longer working, chemotherapy is not working, Pluvicto is not working, and they've had genetic you know, testing that says that they have these advanced diseases and are in high-risk categories. And I think that um, we'll share at the end of this video some resources that you know help find clinical trials, but I'm Am I correct that that's the criteria? Well, I think those are the people who are going to be watching this video. This is the, this is the challenge that they're facing. It's the, we've been so blessed with some really effective treatments, as you already enumerated. But if those aren't working, then that's a desperate situation because that type of cancer is uh, leapfrogged over these very good treatments, and it's going to be an aggressive and potentially life-threatening situation. Scrutinizing clinical trials closely and becoming conversant in the different centers that do these 
consulting. A lot of the doctors are doing video consults now. You can call up large academic centers, ask for a consultation with a medical oncologist specializing in prostate cancer. What clinical trials do you have? And tell me if I'm eligible for them and, and why would this benefit me? It's going to take some, some time and it's going to take some, uh, you know, knocking down doors, but the pace of new discovery in the field of prostate cancer has never been quicker. For example, I have a patient who had gone through all the things that you talked about. Uh, he consulted a doctor at City of Hope who uh, referred him to their nuclear medicine department. Plavicto is an injectable type of radiation that has, uh, it's now FDA approved and it's widely available. But if it stops working, what do you do? This patient had a sort of an enhanced Pluvicto called actinium on a clinical trial. And that uh, represents a more powerful type of radiation. And he has responded. It's been about 18 months since he was treated. His PSA is remaining low on a durable basis, which, uh, and this is an individual that had pretty much run out of options. There are, are things out there that are hopeful. It's not that they don't have side effects and risks, and they're not going to work in everybody, but there is hope for these patients, uh, although it's going to take some legwork. I think one of the points you made earlier that I've seen time and time again when I've seen patients go on clinical trials and have really successful situations is oftentimes finding the right physician to work with them and help them find the clinical trial. So you mentioned a medical oncologist and going to the university, but is there also, you know, the people who are willing to fight for you, the people who are willing to work with you and get on these clinical trials with you? Because it seems like the people like Eugene Kwan or Tanya Dorf, these people that we see, really go into a lot of work making sure that the patient finds the right clinical trial. So how does a patient find a physician like that? There's low average and high quality uh, performers in every field, but I don't think we can expect that uh, one physician at one institution has the, has the resources to start taking someone under their wing and helping them find clinical trials in other parts of the country. These uh, doctors that you mentioned will have their own little set of clinical trials which may or may not fit one individual's needs. I believe that you named two doctors with great integrity and they're not going to try and shoehorn people into a trial that they don't belong in. But I think it behooves the patients themselves to call these different academic centers, of which there are a number in the country, and introduce themselves, consult with the lead doctors, and build relationships with these people to see if that institution has a trial that would fit their needs. As I was talking to Dr. Scholz about clinical trials today, there was a couple of things that I thought about. I know a lot of men who have gone on clinical trials and had durable remissions, and they're still with us decades later. So clinical trials can really be beneficial in the sense that you can get access to a drug early. You can have, sometimes it's all covered and paid for, and even though there is, you know, travel extra blood tests and, you know, scans and different things like that, the other way to look at that is you get more information for free because of the study. And I know many men who have gone on clinical trials and they've learned more about their prostate cancer and even what's available to them outside of the clinical trial because of the information that they received. Overall, I think more information is better, and I do think that that helps you create a bigger picture and more context for how to treat prostate cancer overall. Now, when it comes to finding clinical trials, things that I found very helpful is we help patients on our helpline, clinicaltrials.gov, um, that they do have filters and there's, it's a little complicated, but you definitely can use it and find some good information. There's mailcare.org and they have a quiz you can take that helps you kind of determine clinical trials in your area. Um, I think they do it by zip code. And also our helpline, pcri.org forward slash helpline. They can help you also find clinical trials that you were eligible for. And we have um, provided the service because we want patients patients to know their options, even if maybe some of these, um, you know, advanced drugs no longer are working to lower your PSA, you know, you still have options. There's a lot of clinical trials. There's a lot of research being done in prostate cancer. And I go to these, you know, big research meetings and there's new stuff coming out all the time. You know, there's new technologies coming. And I really appreciate you guys for watching this video. I thank you so much for trusting us and allowing us to give this information to you. I'm gonna go ahead and put those links in the description below the video, but please remember you're not alone. Get the support you need. Even talking to support groups or other men going through this process can help you again, learn information and you can even learn about clinical trials through support groups. So again, please get the support you need both mentally, physically, in every way possible. And thank you for watching and I hope you have a great week.